Father, Christmas is always such a special time of year. We recognize uh, the hope that we have in you. Uh, think of the blessing it is that you came into the world and uh, just one, one, of the, one of the things I've become more and more aware of all the time in life is that you, you're not immune to the difficult times. You're not unsympathetic to the challenges that we experience all the time in life. And you came into the world and you experienced all of that stuff. So, Lord, when we cry out to you and when we, we say, God, we need you, we need everything that you are and all that you offer, we understand that you know exactly why we're crying out to you and you are sympathetic in every way. Um, so, God, thanks for your goodness and your grace and your love for us. Thanks that we can celebrate Christmas, thinking about, um, you know, of all the things that we treasure in life, all the gifts that we have. There's just nothing that compares to the gift of you. So, Father, thanks for the opportunity you give us to celebrate this every year. Father, we all come in here with different things on our mind, different uh, things we're looking forward to or struggles that we're in the midst of. And so, Father, I ask that this morning, no matter where we are, that your Holy Spirit would be our guide um, and that you'd help teach us and shape us to be an offering, like we just sang, an offering that's pleasing to you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm glad you're here this morning. We're going to be looking at uh, Amos. If you have your notes, you can, this is great. Um, you can follow along with where we're going. It'll be a good guide for you and maybe something that you can come back to during the week for discussion or to be reminded of some of the things that God teaches you this morning. So we're going to be looking at just four verses in Amos chapter 8 and then uh, five verses, the, really the last five uh, verses of the book in chapter 9. Um, and so we're going to look at this and think about this from, the, from like three perspectives. Um, the first one is, is I'm going to talk about... Um, is, so Amos is a prophet, and he has got some heavy accusations for the people in the northern kingdom, the same people that Dan was talking about last week. And so we're going to look at what are those accusations that he says the people are guilty of committing. The second thing we're going to look at is um, a lot of times we look at the Old Testament and we see these kinds of things and we go, what the world does this have to do with me? <laughs> uh, is this, does, this, does this have any bearing on my life at all? So we're going to talk about, like, why, why might this stuff be relevant for us today? Um, and when, by the time we're done with that, everybody in here, you're going to be like, is this a Christmas message? <laughs> you're going to be like, what in the world does this have to do with Christmas? And so we'll, we'll dive into why this really is a great opportunity to think about Christmas and what it's all about. So um, the, the series that we're doing is kind of weird. You know, you think about Christmas stuff, and it's typically we think about Jesus and the manger and the angels and the shepherds. And uh, there, we do a lot of messages about that over the years. But um, we're, we're making a stretch here to kind of get out of the normal Christmas uh, uh, stuff, the passages that we look at. And, but, but you can find out that Jesus really is everywhere in the Bible. You can't go anywhere where he's not, he's not the center of of people's hope, expectation, and the, the fulfillment of all of our needs that we have in life. So it's no surprise, really, that, uh, that we, we can find him all over the place. So Amos is a really short book in the Old Testament. There's, there's, there's 15 prophets in your Old Testament. Uh, three of them are major prophets, and 12 of them are minor prophets. And they're not necessarily minor just because they're smaller than the other guys, but, um, but their, 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 messages, um, their messages that the books just tend to be shorter um, for those guys. So Amos has nine chapters in it, and I've got a great resource for you to remind you about. We, we show you videos from the Bible Project regularly, um, and I put, the, I put the address for this video, the whole video, it's seven minutes long. It's at the bottom of your notes there. We're just going to watch the first minute because it, it'll be a great introduction to the book of Amos and sort of give you an overview of some of the things that we're going to be looking at and talk about today. The book of the prophet Amos. Amos was a shepherd and a fig tree farmer who lived right near the border between northern Israel and southern Judah. Now the north had seized its independence about 150 years earlier, remember 1 Kings chapter 12, and it was currently being ruled by Jeroboam II, a successful military leader. He won lots of battles and new territory for Israel and he generated lots of wealth, but in the eyes of the prophets he was one of the worst kings ever. His wealth had led to apathy and he allowed idol worship for the gods of 
of Canaan, which in turn led to injustice and the neglect of the poor. And it got to the point where Amos couldn't take it anymore. He sensed God calling him to go trek up north to Bethel, an important city that had a large temple, and start announcing God's word to the people. And this book is a collection of his sermons and poems and visions uttered over the years. They were compiled later to give God's people a sense of his divine message to the northern kingdom. And it's a message we still need to hear today. Yeah, that really is, I mean, that's an outstanding summary for you. And so he's one of two guys that actually went to the northern kingdom. The other one was the guy that Dan talked about last week, which was Hosea. And, uh, and, and so the odd thing about this, the, this guy is, you know, if, if everything seems like it's going really well in your life, and people are, you know, you've you got some peace and prosperity and people are making money, um, and someone comes and goes, it's not going to go very well for you in the future. Everything's going to fall apart, and God's not happy with you, and destruction is close at hand. If someone comes and tells you that in the midst of peace and prosperity, you might be like, uh, are you, where have you been drinking? <laughs> you know, you might think, is that, are you, I don't think you really see what's going on. You, you would go like, hey, is there any clearer sign that God is blessing us? We've got all this peace, prosperity going on. So like, what could possibly be, what could possibly go wrong? And in 40 years from the time Amos comes, Assyria will come and absolutely terrorize these people in a way that was un... I mean, you and I can't even imagine what it was like. The Syrians were so brutal. Earlier in the year, we, I gave you some very graphic pictures of the destruction that those guys wrought on people. And it was horrific in every way. And lo and behold, exactly what Amos says is going to happen is going to happen. Merry Christmas, right? Already you're going, what the heck are we talking about Christmas stuff? We're looking at this guy for. Um, so I, what I want to do is, as you saw in here, his, his main message is he says, um, he's talking about injustice, especially economic injustice in here. And a really good way just in four verses to capture exactly what he's, he's accusing the people of being guilty of. You can find in chapter 8, verses um, uh, four through seven. So I just want to run through these with you really quickly so you can get a feel for what his, his concerns are and God's concerns for these people. So he says, hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon festivals be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended, that we may market our wheat skimping on the measures, boosting the prices, and cheating with dishonest scales. Buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by himself the pride of Jacob. He says, I'll never forget anything they have done. So this, this, this last little bit is a is, is kind of a, an idiom that might not be easy for us to understand. But like if you are really ser serious about something, you might say, you, you might swear by something that's absolutely unchanging. So you might go, I swear by the sun and the moon and the stars, right? Like something we can count on that doesn't ever change. And you're saying, as surely as those, we can count on those things, you can count on this. And notice what Amos is saying. He's saying, he's saying that the pride of God's not going to ever forget this. And how can you count on that? Because just like Jacob is so rooted in pride and arrogant behavior, you can count that God's never going to forget you guys' evil behavior and the injustices that you pervert. So uh, Jacob was one of the tribes of Israel, and it's a, a, a euphemism for talking about rooted in pride, never going to repent. And God is saying, you can, I'm not going to forget this. This isn't just going to go away. It's not something I'm going to forget or sweep under the carpet. Something's got to be done about this. So I, I think about this in, in your notes. I just want to walk through and give you a sense of like, why is, why, what's going on in here in these verses? So the first thing is you can see that um, there's four things I'm going to point out here. The first one is their greed outweighed their concern for the needy people. So you who trample the needy. This is a picture of uh, the merchant class that are so anxious and so bent on every opportunity to make profit 
that they'll run over people, even the most needy people in the land, uh, their, their fellow countrymen, because profit and making money was the desire of their hearts in every way. They had no concern for the people who most needed the help that they could have offered. Um, so w- one of the things that, that you see in the Bible over and over again is um, you, you're always going to have people that have a lot of resources, and you're always going to live in the midst of people that don't have a lot of resources. And God cares deeply about everyone. And he wants everyone to be able to partake of the riches of the world. And so it, you know, you, if you think about what it means to be religious in the world, or if you think about what it means to have your heart shaped by God, it, it's central that you care about people that have legitimate needs. And one of the things that we do in America is we tend to dismiss ourselves and go, well, I'm not really that rich. When you're talking about rich people or wealthy people, you must be talking about someone else. Uh, the reality is even the poorest person, people that are, have a sign out in front of Raley's asking for money, do you know they have more economic power than about, uh, uh, than about half of the world's population? Uh, what I mean is, is their ability to get enough food, caloric intake to sustain themselves is greater than half of the world's population. So even our poorest of the poor have more economic opportunities to put food in their body and get shelter and clothing than half of the world's population. Don't ever forget that when you think about what it means to be rich, you know, we, we go, the one percenters, and we're thinking about the one percent billionaires in our country. We're all filthy, stinking rich. And, and, and so if you think about what it means to be religious, like I was talking about, the, the, the Old Testament, especially the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, say God structured, you think about the teachings or the laws in the Old Testament, God set up a system so that even the poorest of the poor would have the opportunity to be taken care of. So like if you had a field, you're commanded, don't reap every inch of your field. Leave the corners for the poorest of the poor people to be able to come in harvest to be able to get some resources for themselves from your blessing, from your own profit. A great way of thinking about this, one of my favorite Old Testament um, theologians, a guy named Christopher Wright, he, in, his, in his commentary on Deuteronomy, talking about how there were allowances for the poorest of the poor built into the law, he says this, he says, giving to the needy, it's not only a sacred duty to God, but it's also the defining point for any claim to have kept the law. So if you wanted to say in the Old Testament, you wanted to say, look at me, look at what a righteous person I am. You had no claim to say that was true if you weren't using the resources you had to take care of people that didn't have as much. He goes on to say, he says, uh, only when Israel, the country, responds to the needy by enabling everyone in the community to eat and be satisfied can they affirm they have done everything that the law commanded. The second, his, his second uh, concern that he lies out for these people is their greed outweighed their devotion. So he says, uh, so there's these new moon festivals that they had and the Sabbath, which was, uh, uh, you know, every, they didn't have once a week. A 24-hour block to take a break from everything, including converts. And notice what these people are so bent on. When is it going to be over so we can go back to making money? Even just once a week, they couldn't take a break because they were so concerned about making money. A great, one of the great commentaries I read this week by uh, this guy, T.J. Betts, he says this about, he says, he says, people were thinking about making money more than worshiping the Lord. But the problem Amos confronted, it's far deeper than just that. He says the problem was that they were focused on themselves more than they were on being present and giving God all that he deserves because of how amazing he is. See, they were self-serving in their thoughts and their actions. I mean, if you think about it, if you think about what greed is about, is greed not essentially about selfishness? That's at the root of what greed is all about, is you're thinking of your own self-interests above and beyond anyone else. The third uh, accusation he has, that he says, is their greed outweighed their financial integrity. They, they were ripping people off. They had, uh, they had scales that were set to be able to 
um, uh, allow them to make a profit no matter whether they were buying or selling. And it goes on to say that what they were doing is, uh, is they were stuffing their sacks, not just with grain, but with the chaff as well. So they weren't just selling like the food, but they were selling the junk as well. All just to make money. Now, I know nobody, nobody in America ever Right? I mean, that's not, nobody cheats economically, you know, no businesses ever do this. And no individuals would ever, like, cheat on their taxes, right? We all have financial integrity in everything we do, right? Yeah. Does any of this, does any of this, I mean, is any of this, like, relevant for our, our lives or our world today, right? So uh, the, the, the last one is, is their, their greed, it outweighed their gratitude. So <laughs> that, that idea, this is a really funny verse in there, it talks about, they're, they're selling people for the price of sandals. And, and what Amos is saying is, even the basic necessities of life, like they, they, were, they, would, they would put people in debt just, to, just for the basic necessities that people needed to live. And they would enslave people. They would indebt them. So they had no way of getting out of debt, these poor people. You know, the, the problem with this is, is that of... You know, all of our lives are shaped by something. And what Amos is saying is he's saying, um, your lives are being shaped by self-interest and greed and not by gratitude. And, and, and his, his, the reason this is so ironic or should be ironic is they're enslaving not just foreigners but their own countrymen. And if there's anybody that should understand what it means to, to live with gratitude and graciousness towards other people, it's them. Their whole history is a history of them being slaves in Egypt and God, God coming when they had no way of getting out of the debt that they were in, the slavery that they were in. God comes in and releases them to a life of freedom. If anybody should be their lives should be marked by gratitude. It's them, right? But their life, their, their attitudes are marked by, by greed rather than gratitude. So, so you, you, just in these, these four verses, you get the sense of, well, why, well, you know, why, is, why is God angry? <laughs> it's, it's, not, it, it's not hard to appreciate. In the Old Testament, um, uh, this idea of justice, especially economic injustice, is one of the central themes of the entire Old Testament. Um, so this, this word, this idea of justice, um, occurs 116 times in the Old Testament. And primarily, it, it occurs in the book of Job, because Job wants justice for himself. It, it occurs over and over again in the book of Psalms, because people are crying out for justice and for people to live and act righteously. Uh, and the last place that it occurs over and over again is, is in the prophets. So, I mean, if, if you think about, you know, we tend to think that God is just up there and he's angry all the time about everything, but it's really not that, that's really not the case. There are some, uh, there are a few very specific things that light God's fire and ripping other people off and not taking care of the poor and the needy is absolutely one of them. In fact, the Bible probably talks about money and greed more than any other selfish you know, mark of our selfish lives. So it's no wonder you, you think about why would Amos come to the, why would he come to the northern kingdom and go, hey, you think that this is party time, but I want to tell you the party is, it's over, baby. God's done. He's had it. Don't think that God is unaware. You know, a lot of times we think about judgment as being something like, when you die, you'll stand before God and you'll face judgment. And this is a good reminder that, that God's not unaware of what's going on in our lives, and, and there's a point at which his goodness and his patience can even run out even in this life as well. Um, so uh, uh, you probably already have a sense of this, so I'm just going to run through this quickly with you, but why is something like this, why is this relevant to us? And the first thing is, is I, I'm going to move from economic stuff just to thinking about selfishness in general, but I don't want I don't want to like paste over like economic realities in our lives as well. I think, I think one of the, you know, for me anyways, I don't know if this is an issue for you, but you know, I'm always thinking 
about what I want and how to get it and how money is a tool and a resource for me to be able to enrich myself or buy things that I assume are going to bring me more pleasure or peace in life. Uh, the, the Bible is such a good check when I read stuff like this because it reminds me that you know, my life, it's a gift that God's given me. Everything I have in my life is a gift that God's given me. And ultimately, none of it, even my own life, belongs to me. God, God asks, he gives us this stuff and he richly gives us so much in life. And he wants us to be generous and good stewards of everything we have in life, right? Uh, and that includes our economic stuff. David, the lights are flickering. I can see some people are annoyed by them. I don't know if we can turn them up or turn them off. Or I've, you, you know I preach to the, you know, like we have the electricity go out. I had to yell and scream, which I'm sure you all loved, right? But, these are not uncommon issues. So why is this relevant? So um, let me just run through this. So I, I, I really want, to, I want you to think about beyond just economic issues. I just want you to think about how we tend to be like, how can I use, how can I, how can I get from other people things to benefit myself? Um, Donald, Donald Miller, it is, it is book, Blue Like Jazz. I remember reading this like 20 years ago. He's got this great He's got this great uh, illustration. He, he comes to his pastor, and his pastor says, uh, he says, you know how the easiest way for you to overcome your selfishness? And uh, he's, he's, an, he's, he's an older single guy, and the pastor says to him, I want you to move in with some roommates. And he's like, how is that going to help me? How am I going to learn about selfishness from that? And he finds out very quickly that everything that happens in the house annoys him because he's always done everything that he wants to do. And he has this great illustration. He says, it's like life is a movie, and I'm the star. I, sh I, I am the main theme in every scene. And the minute he starts moving with, with these other guys, and it can't always be about him anymore, he realizes, oh, my gosh. I am a self-centered person. And at the drop of a hat, the smallest things, I freak out because I don't get my way. And he talks about how he uses manipulation, all these creative techniques, most of which he's unaware that he's even using to get his own way from his roommates. And he, he finds out very quickly, his pastor was right, what a great way to find out how selfish he is. So Paul warns about this, right, in Philippians chapter 1. He says, he, says, he says, don't do anything. Recognize how easy it is to exercise selfish ambition. See, I, I think at the core of this economic injustice is the same thing that's true for all of our selfish desires is I want, I want the world to revolve around me and I want other people to serve and enrich me, whether it's financially or sexually, whatever pleasure you want. That tends to come first in our life. And so you get, I just want you to think about the, the tools of coercion that are so common to get what we want in the world from other people. Um, so you, uh, you think about like um, uh, tools like begging people until they give us, they give in. Uh, anger is a great tool. We train people to know I'm going to flip out if I don't get my way. And we train people to go, oh, as soon as, I, as soon as you give in, then you'll calm down. We're great at learning how to use that technique to train people to get what we want. Tantrums. Like, how many of you have seen this at a store and you realize how destructive it is? You see a little kid, I want a candy, I want the candy, uh, I want the toy, I want the toy. And the parents are like... I just want to go shopping, so if I buy one of these things, my kid will shut up, <laughs> right? We learned, even from a very young age, how to use these different tools to man manipulate other people to serve us and give us what we want in life. Think about passive-aggressive behavior. See, passive-aggressive be people, the reason people fall into this trap is because they, it is effective, it is effective to let other people know, oh, that person's not happy with me. I must have done something wrong 
to tick them off. And if I do something right for them, they'll be happy again. There's probably little that is as self-centered because passive aggressive behavior is never looking out for other people. It's always rooted in self-centeredness. Uh, extortion is a great one. And we typically, we typically limit extortion to just like business stuff, but I want you to think about this. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times that I've sat in my office with people in marriage counseling and heard people say like, um, why should I do for you fill in the blank? Because you never do blank for me. Do you realize that's an extortion tactic? And man, oh man, we're not even aware of how we use these tools of manipulation to get what we want. The last thing uh, that, that's so simple, it's, it's, I mean, it's so, it's so subtle that it's easy to overlook, which is this idea that he, he accuses the people of, which is, um, so like, you're like, you're, there's this hypocrisy that goes on, he's saying. You guys come into these, the, the, you know, he's saying, you merchants, you come into the worship service, and you're there to worship God, but you're not there. You can't wait to get out of here and this stuff to be over so you can go make money. Now, I know none of us ever do this. Like, I mean, we never go to church and like look at our phones and go, is my, is my team winning? Wait, what's the score now? <laughs> we, we never go to church and like we're self-conscious because there's a song that we're singing and we go, if, if I raise my hands right now, am I going to look weird? Are people going to think I'm, there's something wrong with me? You know, we're, we're more concerned with what other people think than worshiping God. I, I, I remember I got a lesson in this so good when I was a kid. I've, I, I, was, I, I've, I became a Christian when I was in high school. And I first started going to church uh, like the end of my freshman year. And I, I can remember very first church service I was ever in. I can remember it as clearly today as it, like it was yesterday. I'm sitting in the, the back row with my buddy, Chris Miller, who I surfed and skated with. And uh, Chris was this frumpy, hang loose, mind had been altered by all the pot he had smoked in his life guy. Uh, but we had a great time hanging out. So I'm, I'm in the back row with him. And we're the first worship song we're, they're singing at church. This is like my first time in church either. And, and we start singing, and, and I, I, I think I had the sense to know that my voice sucked. So I was like, I'm not going to sing loud because I don't want to annoy anybody else. And Chris next to me, I'm thinking, if anybody's got a worse voice in the world than me, it's this guy. And I'm right next to him, and he's belting it out. It's kind of like if you've ever had to sit next to Dan and heard him sing during church, right? You wish that he had this self-restraint to go like, hey, this is, exactly, no self-restraint, right? So like, um, the song is over. And I remember, I'm thinking, I'm gonna do this guy a favor. I'm gonna help him out. And so I lean over to him and I go, I'm like, Chris, your voice sucks, man. I go, you're, I think you might be embarrassing yourself and annoying other people. And this, this guy who I, I, I didn't hold in very high esteem for being really sharp turns to me and says one of the most brilliant things I've ever heard any Christian ever say. He says, it's okay, I wasn't singing for you, Noah. <laughs> Whoa. See, I mean, that's... that's Man, is that, I, I know even now it's not like I'm over this. I still come to church, especially because I work in the church, and I'm always evaluating things. Why, why are the lights the way they are? Why, what's going on with the music? Those speakers, the, blah, blah, blah. why did Dan do that? Why, does Dan know his flies on zip? Does Dan know he's spitting? Does Dan know he... <laughs> <laughs> it's a great equalizer, isn't it? Dan's way better at throwing me under the bus than I am him. But um, I, I mean, we, it, is this not true? Like, we come into church, it would be great if we could like walk through the doors and go, I'm here today because my life and this week has been a challenge or the things that I've been excited about 
I want to leave that all out there because I'm coming in to meet with you, God, and your people. And I'm here to celebrate you. And that's like, that's the core of what's going on in your heart and your head. Wouldn't that be beautiful? Everybody knows how hard that is to do. Everybody. These people were up, you know, ramped way overboard on that whole issue. So by this time, you really are asking, what in the heck does this have to do with a Christmas message? See, I think, wouldn't you, wouldn't you all say, you, I think you'd all say, I get why God's angry at people who live like this. This isn't acceptable. This is making, this is making a mockery of every good thing that God intended life to be about. And, and if we know anything about God, we know that he, he's a just God, and he's not just going to sweep stuff under the carpet. He's not going to pretend like it's not an issue. He's not just going to excuse bad behavior. And that's one of the things that we love. Like, we want justice. We see really, we see evil in the world, and we want someone who's going to settle accounts and make things right. Um, but how is God going to make things right in the world if the problem in the world is, is us, <laughs> how is he going to do that? How is he going to reconcile things? How is he going to make things right if we're the problem? And to make things right means disciplining us. That's, that's a hard balance. We want justice. We want justice for the world, especially for other people, but we want mercy for ourselves. How is God going to, how is he going to manage that? So what's, what's interesting is, is it's so easy to miss this because literally in the book of Amos, it's just the last five verses and it's the only real note of hope in the whole book. And I just want to read it to you real quick. He says this, he closes the book by saying in that day, he's saying there is going to be a good future. I'm going to do something about this. He says, I'll restore David's fallen shelter. David's shelter is David was their king. And he was the person they most looked up to as a ruler. And he's gone. And every good thing that he was about is gone. And he says, I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins. I'll rebuild it as it used to be. So that they may possess the remnant of Edom. Now, Edom was their biggest enemy. The people they had, the biggest thorn in their side were the Edomites. And, and Amos is saying, there's going to be a time in the future where it's not just going to be good for you, but for even the people that you have the hardest time with, it's going to be even good for them. And all of the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. He says, uh, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will overtake the plowman and the planter by the one treading the grapes. There's such abundance in the future, God says, that you're going to, be, you're going to still be cleaning the fields, and it's going to be time to start planting again. That's, that's how much abundance there's going to be. You're still going to be treading the grapes that you harvested in June, and when it's time to start getting things ready in December, you're not going to be done treading the grapes. That's the picture of abundance that's coming in the future. New wine will drip from the mountains that flow from the hills. And remember, the hilltops is where nothing, you know, there's little soil up there. Nothing grew big. Everything was down in the valleys. So even up high, there's abundance. And I'll bring my people, Israel, back, back from exile. He's saying, You're, God's going to discipline you, man. He's not putting up with this. But there will be a future where he will bring you back. They'll rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They'll plant the vineyards and drink the wine. They'll make gardens and eat the fruit. And I'll plant them in Israel, their own land. Never, never, never. There will be a future where never will you have to worry about this stuff ever again. Does that sound like a good world? Does that sound like a good future? That felt like a good place to live. Yeah, it is something we all long for, man. When will God do this? So um, you can see in here, there's this tension in here that he's exploring between. He's talking about judgment and God needs to do something about the evil. But he also, God is committed to his people and he's committed to restoring 
the good things in the world. And you can see in this book, there's this tension between these two things. And the people living in Amos's time couldn't imagine how God was going to set things right. How is God going to do this? How is God going to meet his demand for justice and provide a path for forgiveness for the people but still deal with injustice and evil in the world? Do you know that's why Jesus, that's a big part of why he came into the world. See, Jesus, Romans tells us that he was crushed for us. He who knew no sin, Corinthians tells us, became sin for us. How does, how does God deal with the problem of injustice? Who ultimately gets crushed for the sins of the world, the sins you and I commit that we're culpable for? See, Jesus does for us what we can't do for ourselves, and God still deals with the righteous demands of the evil in the world. It just doesn't land on you and I. So one of the things that we make the mistake of thinking is somehow that uh, forgiveness is free. And it does come freely to us, doesn't it? But it was very costly to God. So just in closing, you think about this, like God, Jesus really is. He's the premier gift that you're ever, that the world's ever been offered the opportunity to have a part in. And, it, and, and, and just like it says up there, it comes to us freely. Not because you earn it, not because you're going to get your act together. It comes to us just by God's sheer goodness and grace. See, the, the, the cool thing about this is notice that Jesus is, who's going to make the world right? Who's going to set everything right? Is it you and I because we get our act together? No, it's Jesus who is the restorer of David's family and kingdom. You know what's interesting about this passage that we just read? The book of Acts, chapter 15, or is the Council of Jerusalem, and they're getting together and they're trying to figure out, like, uh, there's this crazy new thing happening in the world. And they're trying to figure out what to do about it because they've got this, this church is starting to grow and it's got people who aren't Jewish that are coming into it by droves. And they're like, what do we do about this? Uh, Jesus was Jewish. God's promise was supposed to be for the Jewish people, but he's clearly opened this up to everyone. And you know the verse that they, they quote in Acts chapter 15? It's this out of Amos chapter 9 where they say, the the tent is being rebuilt. The walls are being rebuilt. And it's Jesus that did all of this. He's the one who restores the fortunes of the world. See, he's, he's the great reconciler. He's the one who has brought us all together, which is what that verse is talking about. He's brought together all things in heaven and on earth. That's the relationship we have with God and with each other. Jesus is the one who makes it possible for us. How can you live in, how can you practice forgiveness in your own life? People wrong you, especially horribly. And Jesus, when he teaches people to pray, he says, forgive others as you have been forgiven. See, the, way, the path to forgiveness is when you recognize how gracious God's been with you, you recognize my, my act of worship to him is to be gracious and forgiving to other people. That's why we do that. See, ultimately, this is because Jesus is the one who should, sh he came into the world to be sin for us, but also to be the example. See, God, isn't this cool? Does anybody, do any one of you like it when somebody else tells you what to do but doesn't do it themselves? Yeah. Well, none of us like that. See, the thing about all this is that you can't ever forget is is you can't ever go, yeah, but God doesn't really know what it's like for me and the pain that I've experienced. <laughs> and you can't ever go like, well, does God really expect me to forgive someone when I, Jesus, with the Romans beating nails into his body, and he says, Father, for... See, Jesus is an example for us. And that's, exact, I mean, that's exactly what John says in John 13, verse 14 and 15. He says, then he says, Lord, he says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, if I've washed your feet, what does he say? Don't worry about it because nobody else ever has to do that again. No, no, no. What does he say? You also what? Ought to wash one another's feet. He says, 
For I've given you an ex example that you should do as I have done. So what's like the, see, the hope for the world that we experience is Jesus. And Jesus has this expectation that as he shapes our life and changes us, that we would be the hope for the world because our lives have been marked by his goodness and grace in every way. Now, what's the hope that the world needs? It's Jesus. And what's the great gift? It's him. That's why we celebrate Christmas. We're excited about him coming into the world. We recognize what it means to us. But God also wants us to be that same gracious gift with other people. Yeah. He says to the Good Samaritan, he says, uh, you know what love is. Go and do likewise. In your, in your bulletin there, you can see, I was talking with Nick this last week. We were talking about love. What's love? What does it look like? Uh, we were talking about a great definition that we had read in a book. And on the front page there, Nick said, I, he, he spent a lot of time thinking about this. And I think Nick's definition is pretty darn good. He says, uh, thinking of yourself less, right? Don't, don't, don't use anger, extortion. Don't use your economic power to get things from other people. Think of, don't be self-centered. Think of yourself last and learn to give. Jesus came and he gave everything for us. Let's work hard at being generous and gracious with our own lives and all that we have. Father, thanks for your love for us. So good to reflect. You know, we, we could talk about us being loving and gracious and forgiving but it, has, it really, I mean, the, the, our hallmark of what all of that is about is you. Uh, Lord, we want to come closer and closer to you and our lives to be, you know, we want to grow in our appreciation for your mercy and your goodness. And we just, you know, there's a sense in which we can trust that as we come closer to you, that you will change our hearts. So, Father, as we think about gratitude uh, would your spirit move in our lives to help us have a great sense of appreciation for what Christmas and the gift of you coming into the world and the hope that you offer is all about? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody, and a good time preparing for Christmas.